Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. Okay. Ja, wir brauchen die NATO. Wir sind everywhere, from Lithuania to the Sahel, to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to Lebanon. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Hello, I'm Olga Olaker. I'm Hugh Pope. Welcome. Here on War and Peace, we talk about Europe, Russia, the neighborhood that the two of them share, Turkey, and the issues that affect all of these countries. We're going to be paying particular attention to conflict, both in the region and nearby, and the conflicts that these countries get involved in far away. We want to understand how states' policies and actions help or hinder prospects for peace and resolution. Today in the studio, we have with us Jeremy Shapiro. Jeremy is the Director of Research for the European Council on Foreign Relations. And he's been thinking a lot lately, along with uh, some of his colleagues at ECFR, about what European sovereignty could mean. Uh, I don't think we're going to cover all of European sovereignty. We um, might. We might. You never know. It doesn't might. take that long, actually, it turns out. <laughs> so maybe that's, maybe that's what we could begin with. Well, you know, I think what, when we're talking about sovereignty... We're not exactly talking about security threats in the traditional way. I mean, it certainly does get down to that. But fundamentally, we're talking about something more political, something more fundamental, which is the ability to operate independently in the world. That's, to me, what sovereignty means. And that's what we're referring to when we talk about European sovereignty. Europe is a really strange place. It's quite secure, I suppose. I mean, it doesn't, uh, certainly relative to most parts of the world, it doesn't have massive security threats. But in part, as a result, it has involved itself into a place in the world where it's incredibly reliant on others for its security. And actually, its relative safety that we talked about results to a large degree from its relationship with the United States, Mm -hmm. from that strong alliance that it has with the United States. That's obviously a great deal for Europe. They're paying somewhat less for their security, and it's going quite well. But what we're starting to understand in the last few years, particularly since President Trump has taken over, but I would argue even before then, is that that security comes at a cost. It comes at a cost of European independence, European sovereignty. It's great to be safe, but if you don't if you don't get to make your own choices, what, what are you mm-hmm. safe for? So I want to come back to the U.S. relationship, but before that, I, I'm just struck by this notion of talking about the independence of something that's actually conglomeration of ostensibly independent components, right? You're yeah. talking about the independence of a whole bunch of countries together who might conceivably think of each of themselves as independent and might even disagree. Yeah, no, that's a fair definitional question, and I think it's in the study, which everybody should read, um, we focus on that a lot. Where I started was to go back to um, Alan Millward's book, Um, from the early 90s. He wrote this book called The European Rescue of the Nation State. And he was wrestling with precisely that question with regard to more to domestic policy, with regard to the things that the European Union was already doing, trade policy, um, single market stuff. And what he was saying was what the European Union represented for the member states was not precisely a loss of sovereignty and a loss of independence. It was a recognition, a hard-nosed recognition, that as small countries in the world, they actually didn't have, they could sort of stand up and say, we are sovereign, we are independent countries, but they didn't actually have the capacity to operate as independent countries because they were too overwhelmed by their stronger neighbors. And so what they had done, semi-consciously in the 1950s and 60s, is band together with like-minded neighbors and do what he called pool sovereignty and actually enhance their sovereignty by working together. And so, I don't know, sometimes in Europe today, people don't think that's a good deal. I think if you ask the Hungarians, they would say, you know, actually, the biggest threat to our sovereignty is Brussels, not Washington or or even Moscow. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about acting independently. But uh, it seems a strange thing to do when, for me, from my perspective, one of the main problems with the European Union is that the member states don't seem to 
own. They don't seem to feel ownership of the EU club that they belong to. They don't defend the actions of the EU to their, their home countries. They do not allow the EU to market itself yeah. to, to their own countries. So it seems like a big step towards acting independently if, if even the club itself is not being respected. I mean, you said Hungary. What about Britain, right? Yeah, no, I mean, I certainly agree. I think it, there's a couple of ways to look at it, though. In fact, the European Union already does quite a bit for these countries. In fact, the European Union is enhancing their sovereignty. And in fact, they are using it in that way, Hungary as well as everybody else. And in fact, Britain is about to find out just how much they're doing that. But I take your point very well that in fact, the, a lot of national leaders don't act that way. They are, assert their independence, they, they denigrate Brussels at every step, and they use it in their national politics. I certainly expect that to continue. But there is a reality here. And I think reality actually matters. The Hungarians can use the political rhetoric as much as they want about being independent from Brussels. But they don't have a choice to have an independent foreign policy that is a Hungarian foreign policy. They have limited choices. They can work with their European partners where they have a voice, where they admittedly are 1 or 27, and that requires compromise, or maybe it's 28 as of today, I lost count, where they, you know, where they, they are a voice, but they have to make compromises, or they can be told what to do by Washington or Moscow or even Beijing. Those are their choices. So get told I, what to do by 27 of your closest neighbors or get told what to do by not, somebody else. But I think that that's an unfair way of looking at it. The European Union has an entire process. Hungary is very, very good at using this process. Washington doesn't have that process. Moscow has no process. <laughs> uh, Beijing has, um, you know, a diktat. So uh, to compare these things, I think, which admittedly, I think a lot of European uh, capitals do. I mean, I think the logic that you're talking about is one that is out there, but it's a stupid one. Mm -hmm. uh, this Brussels is not the same in any way, shape or form as listening to Donald Trump or Xi Jinping or Vladimir Putin. Uh, and Hungary has a lot of opportunity, a lot of influence, a lot of capacity to create, you know, uh, subgroupings that work with it. And in fact, does this all the time very successfully. So the idea that European Union foreign policy isn't representing Hungary, I think, or any other member state mm -hmm. is quite wrong. The idea that it has to make compromises, the idea that it is difficult, the idea that it requires negotiation. Yeah, that's absolutely true. But that's what mm. the reality of foreign policy in today's world. Yeah, another side of it, the ownership, I think, is the whole question of obeying the rules. It seems mm. that over time, the idea of the EU representing a body of higher level rules, the kind of things that attracted the neighborhood, the soft power that we remember from the 1990s, was all about how there was a body of rules that people would sign on to and they would really be respected. Yeah. But increasingly, that seems to be breaking down. And if the members are not keeping that up, how can the EU maintain that internal momentum that was working on almost automatic pilot. Yeah, look, I think it's that's a, a formidable challenge. And I think that the, um, again, I, we keep coming back to Hungary, which is slightly unfair, but only slightly. I you think can pick that, another one. Yeah. Well, it's the best <laughs> consider, example. Consider Poland, <laughs> consider... <laughs> well, I mean, Hungary is definitely mm -hmm. the best example for the phenomenon that Hugh is talking about. And Poland is not quite as good an example, but I suppose it also makes some sense. I think, you know, there is, well, maybe there's a different way, a slightly different way of looking at it. Truth is that EU rules have never been perfectly followed, to put it mildly. And it's very interesting to look at the distribution of who follows the EU rules. It's not the countries you expect. I bet um, it's mainly Britain. I think that's the Britain, biggest British problem Britain, is that we actually obey all the rules. And that's why exactly. we got into the mess we're in. Yeah. I think the British <laughs> Your Brexit diagnosis. <laughs> well, I don't think he's I think he's very right. I, I guess I always think that about Hugh. It's probably one of my big failings, but um <laughs> <Carry on>. uh, <laughs> we'll, 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 keep, well, we'll make him a third co-host, won't we? He's on this way. Yeah. Uh, look, I think that the British never understood the European Union approach to the rules. If you want to understand how a European Union rule is not a rule in the way that uh, a British law is. It is something which is, make, which is the starting point for a negotiation about behavior. It's a norm. Okay, if you want to call it a norm, it's, it's, it's a rule, it's a law. It has the same technical status, um, but they have a very different cultural approach to it in a lot of parts of the European Union. I would say this is even true in Germany, 
where you wouldn't know that by observing the behavior at crosswalks. Uh, in fact, if you look at their implementation of European rule, Union rules, it's a lot less than Britain. So it's a postmodern and, approach. To- uh, semi. I mean, I, I think we don't want to take this too far. It's not that they're not observing the rules in the main and in the spirit, but is a recognition that European Union rules need to be applied in a certain context. They need to make sense for the people who are doing them, and that the European Union isn't an enforcement agency. Uh, And so, in fact, it is up to a good faith government to uh, interpret, impose those rules, and sometimes the partners won't like it, and sometimes, most often, it won't matter at all. I think Hungary has stretched that to a significant degree, but actually, I don't think it's a wholly new practice. I do think it represents, as, as he was implying, a massive challenge But the fundamental point is not to focus on this idea that either a rule is being respected and observed precisely or the European Union is falling apart. Rather, it is to make sure the European Union is nothing more than a servant to its member states. It needs to be delivering for its member states. If it is doing things that its member states want and need, then its rules will, in the main, be observed. And we see that all the time in the places where the European Union performs well, in the trade regime, in the competition regime. We see it less often in places like migration and foreign policy. But the the solution to that is not, to my mind, Article 7 procedures, which try to uh, adopt a sort of domestic legal approach to uh, something which is a fundamentally political relationship. Rather, it is to improve performance, to understand what it is that Hungary needs, for example, out of European Union foreign policy, what it is that Poland needs out of European Union foreign policy, and to deliver that. And I think, you know, that's a significant challenge. (laughs) I don't think they're doing terribly well in that either, but it's a very different type of process. What our study is really focused on is we took six different areas of European Union, or European, not really European Union, but European foreign policy. They were um, secondary sanctions, defense, multilateralism, hybrid threats, economic sovereignty. That's the one, interestingly, I wrote. Um, Anyway, the point, what we were looking at with those is, okay, these are actual problems. These aren't just problems for Europe. These are problems principally for member states. Different member states have different problems in different areas. What we first demonstrated in each area is that the European Union, or not even the European Union, the Europe and its member states were on a track to lose their capacity to act independently in all of these areas. To a large degree, they had already, but it, the situation was likely to get worse. And that was going to be a problem for the member states in a variety of different ways, economically, diplomatically, in terms of security. And here are ways where if working together, it's often through the European Union, but often in other types of conglomerations, uh, where you can actually preserve your independence, again, in this, mm-hmm. in this sort of attenuated way mm-hmm. that we discussed before, and that you can do better, that, that not just the European Union, but the idea of being part of a European community can deliver for the member states in areas like this, it's not limited to those, which are very important to them. So let's talk about the United States and the dangers of dependence on America. Do you think that since Donald Trump has been elected president, right, there's been two schools of thought, right? One is that this is a symptom and therefore, you know, long past time to respond to an America that is not always value additive. Then there is the view that this is a blip. You just got to live through it and uh, America will be back to normal and it, it'll be a security provider that everyone can trust. I suspect you're more of the first opinion. I'm probably more of the first opinion as well. I'm not sure about you. Um, but let's talk through that. What are the costs of dependence on the United States for Europeans? I think you've correctly characterized me. I would be mostly of the first opinion. Um, I think that there is a sort of long-term trend in this regard that shows that the United States is, you know, slowly but surely going to be a less useful security provider uh, for Europe. I I also think it's important, though, to say that there's also a blip. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, it's a blip in the same direction. I think Donald Trump is leaning into an American trend that was already in American policy, but he's accelerating it dramatically. There may well be a sort of dead cat bounce backwards uh, if he ceases to be president, especially if he he loses the next election. But I think that the trend will resume. 
Uh, and so Donald Trump isn't essential to this analysis. He has been, as you're implying, quite essential to um, getting, I think, Europeans to focus on it. And I think, you know, he and Vladimir Putin have been really, I think, the primary motivators of this idea that actually Europe, Europe needs to be acting more independently. I think in terms of, you know, the costs that Europe pays, uh, I mean, we just don't have to look any further than the than the headlines in the news just recently. I mean, uh, the Iran portfolio is quite extraordinary in this regard. And I think it was a real, even more in some ways than Donald Trump, it was a real wake-up call. Because on Iran, the story that Europeans always told themselves is, if we're united, if we know what we want to do, if we have a firm policy, then we we don't need the agreement of the United States. We can work even in opposition to the United States. And in fact, all of those conditions were satisfied in the case of the U.S. abrogation of the Iran deal. And the U.S. essentially said, you know what, we don't care that you don't agree with what we're doing. Which is actually what the United States has been saying for a very long time on a number of cases. Uh, not to this degree, actually. Not, not for a policy that Europe had thought of as its signature achievement in foreign policy in the last 10 years. I mean, it's impossible to overestimate the degree to which European officials are proud, justifiably proud, of the work that they did on Iran over the last 10 or 15 years to create the compromise that the Obama administration eventually found with the Iranians, that that really was, I think, legitimately a European achievement, exactly the kind of achievement that they said they should be able to have uh, vis-a-vis the United States. We're going to show them that there's another way. We're going to do it through unity. We're going to pull them along. We're going to get them to come to our opinion. They did all of that. And it all fell apart when Donald Trump became president, and they couldn't do anything about it. And not only that, but they are now being forced to take Donald Trump's side. And that you can see Macron making a last ditch effort not to do that, but he's probably going to fail. And what was demonstrated is that the central position of the United States in the security of Europe, in the financial system of Europe, in Europe's ability to even have a sanctions policy meant that they couldn't have an independent policy on Iran. It didn't matter what they thought. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. And we're talking to Jeremy Shapiro from the European Council on Foreign Relations. Listening to you as an American uh, seeking to buttress European unity and sovereignty maybe (laughs) made me think of that old trope about seeking the European telephone number. And I had a very interesting conversation with an American diplomat here in Brussels representing the United States, the EU, recently saying that, in fact, that telephone number for the United States was in London, that whenever the US needed something in the EU, they would call up London and say, could you fix this for us, please? Yeah. Uh, clearly, this is not going to be a viable strategy and that the European, the US is going to have to engage with Europe in a, in a, or the EU in a new way. What dynamics will this, br- new dynamics will this bring into play? Yeah, that's interesting. Look, I think that was always a bit exaggerated, to be honest with you. I, I, certainly, the United States did use Britain in that way, but they had about 10 or 12 other choices um, <laughs> to for that purpose. Um, and in fact, they have a lot of different choices. The, the British were a very good choice for that, in part because they were really good at working the European system. I mean, probably one of the deep ironies of Brexit is that is that probably the British were the best of any country of getting things out of the European Union. They had a very impressive diplomatic corps. They really understood the system. They arguably worked the system better than anybody else. Uh, you know, the French and the Germans might disagree, but whatever. And so they were very helpful, I think, for the Americans on specific portfolios. But other countries are plenty helpful. Uh, and there are lots of different ways of doing this. And the United States is is reasonably effective on its own at, uh, at working within the European Union system. I think it's important to understand not that in talking about why the United States might want a European Union that actually functions. I know that's not the view of the Trump administration, but it's my view, and it's not my view as somebody who's the research director of the European Council on Foreign Relations. It's my view as a as an American citizen and as a former American official, because I think that even though on specific portfolios it can be quite tempting, and, and every administration has done it, to divide the European Union, and it's not very hard for uh, for the United States, 
a Europe which is strong, which is effective, which is a partner on a bunch of different foreign policy issues is really important for the United States and it's going to be dealing with countries like China and Russia. And, you know, to be able to sacrifice that for getting a better deal on a, you know, a trade pact or something like that seems to me to be very, very short-sighted. So the United States, you mentioned, is, uh, you know, the Donald Trump is one of the primary motivators for European uh, recognition of its need for greater independence, and Vladimir Putin is the other. But there's a lot of uh, very divided opinion in Europe on Russia, perhaps so European opinion on Russia is more divided than European opinion on the United States. How, how does one work through that? Um, well, I would disagree with the premise, which is always an effective way of dodging the question. I think that, in fact, Europe is more divided on the United States than on uh, than on Russia. I think on Russia, you see the sort of sanction policy demonstrates. You see that there is a fair amount of agreement on the on how to deal with Russia. There's, uh, it's the well, sanctions in the near term, but that's not a long, sanctions are not a long term strategy. Well, they don't have long term strategies on anything. Uh, that's that can't be the description of a disagreement. Mm-hmm. But in fact, uh, you, if you look at the Foreign Affairs Council debates on Russia, they're they're not that fierce. Um, in fact, they, uh, there's a general recognition of the security problem that Russia presents, of the ways in which they have to do that in terms of, of, of deal with that, in terms of supporting particularly these what I tend to call these in-between countries, and of maintaining the sanctions regime and of the approach toward Crimea and toward Ukraine, broadly speaking. Of course, there is a lot of disagreement along the edges and everything. I don't want to take this too far. But actually, when you look at European foreign policy, it's one of the areas of greater consensus. And this, of course, wasn't true before the invasion of Crimea and Ukraine. So it's quite a change over the last okay, 10 years. So that gets us to consensus more than it gets us to independence. Or yes. do you see these as very much the same? No, I don't see them as the same, and you're, you're perfectly right to point out that distinction. Um, I think there is a great deal of consensus on what to do about Russia, but there isn't, a, there isn't a, a very good idea of how to do it, because in fact there isn't a lot of independence. And uh, So, for example, I would argue that the Russia policy of Europeans, generally speaking, is incredibly dependent on the United States. Right, I mean, the consensus is, is with America, right? I think, you know, right now, excluding President Trump, the, the, there's a pretty well-shared consensus between the United States and Europe about Russia. The, Russia policy was, you know, a, a real source of disagreement prior to the Ukraine crisis. And since the Ukraine crisis, it's not it, either both transatlantically and within Europe, it's not anywhere near as much of a source of disagreement. But that doesn't mean they know what to do about it. And I think what Europe is suffering, potentially suffering from when it comes to Russia, is that American policy is incredibly variable. I mean, it hasn't, you know, this hasn't been a problem to this day, but it could be tomorrow because the President of the United States does not share the Russia policy of the United States. (laughs) And he is clearly, he is clearly wanting to revolutionize that policy. Luckily, he doesn't know how, so that saves us. He has no idea how at the moment. He probably doesn't have the right personnel in place. He has other fish to fry. And so it hasn't been very high on his radar screen. It hasn't been high on his priority list, which is, you know, only has one item on it. So I think it's not, it's not been a problem to this moment. But a reelected Donald Trump or even a Donald Trump next year who, uh, you know, has too many cheeseburgers or something, it could very well on any given day completely tra- change U.S.-Russia policy. And I don't know what the Europeans would do about that. I'm not sure that they're in a place to do anything about it. The Poles, for example, who have been, you know, in the forefront of the effort to flatter Donald Trump don't seem to recognize this danger at all. Well, I think the Poles have a very specific view of what Russia policy ought to be where you do start getting into some disagreements with other European countries. Uh, to a degree, sure. But what I'm like referring to is that they have that. they are um, courting a president of the United States who basically has in his heart of hearts, if he has one, the exact opposite Russia policy that they have. Than the Poles do, absolutely. Uh, I guess they believe that he just is never going to do this, that they'll be protected by, I don't know, uh, Mike Pompeo or somebody. I, I can't quite figure out what they're thinking is going to happen. But a reelected Donald Trump, a Donald Trump who has uh, slowly but surely, and we see this trend over the last three years, getting control of his own government. 
he is putting into place more of his preferences this year than he did last year and assumedly next year that trend will continue. And in a second term, I, I would imagine that Russia policy would be very high on his list. He's, it's very clear that he's enormously frustrated and angry about his own Russia policy, about his own government's Russia policy. So we are out of time on that incredibly Ooh. ominous note. Um, <laughs> sorry. It just means we're going to have to have I you back to... a little to, long, sorry. We'll, we'll have to bring you back to talk about, about all of this some more. But uh, Jeremy Shapiro, thank you very much for joining us here on War and Thanks Peace. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in to War and Peace. Um, if you want to read more about the European Council on Foreign Relations work on European sovereignty, you can go to their website, ecfr.appropriatelyenough, EU. So we'll be back in two weeks. And in the meantime, big thanks to our producer, Bill media as well. And uh, thanks to all of you for tuning in. Goodbye. Goodbye. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.